I see us. Okay, so let's talk about a bunch of nerdy things that I'm gonna share with you guys today. I am super excited. Um, so if you're watching on Facebook, welcome to the Pandemic Pinup Happy Hour. Um, I'm trying to do themes now, just like every, that way there's something that you can kind of focus on. Because in the beginning when I started this, it was just like, hey guys, this is what I'm drinking, all this and that craziness. I'm gonna share it with you guys. But we've done the champagne theme where we did a bunch of cocktails based on champagne. We did the Tiger King in quarantine class. Um, that was the topic that was suggested. And then I got to really watch the show, lose like six hours of my life, and then <laughs> design cocktails based on my experience. You're welcome. You're welcome. <laughs> but today we're going to do savory cocktails because I had a little chef light bulb moment earlier last week. So I came up with recipes that are all vegetable based for the most part. They're very not, well, they're not very sweet or they're very savory forward. Um, the whole concept of most of these cocktails is to just kind of sip them outdoors as the weather's getting nice, or, you know, don't crank your AC really high and just have a nice little cold beverage. Um, there's a lot of really interesting things we'll be doing. A lot of prep is involved in some of these cocktails. If y'all follow along with the charts and the lists of things that I send out for you guys to do at home, um, these were a little more involved, but that doesn't make them complicated. So I'm going to just kind of walk y'all through some of the processes I did. If you did them at home and got different results or you're having trouble with them, please reach out. I'm definitely here to give you any kinds of answers. And then a lot of these ingredients will also be a part of the cooking class in about three hours. So we are going to start with, let's see, I think we'll start with the craziest one. So I don't like Bloody Marys. It is something I have never gotten behind. And I don't like them for two reasons. First is I don't really enjoy tomato juice or raw tomatoes for that matter. But I don't like the Bloody Mary as a bartender because there's no blanket way to do them correctly, right? If you make a margarita for anybody, usually you can find a really good baseline and then somebody might be asking you, oh, could I have a little sweeter, a little more sour, and that's about it, or maybe a little more alcohol. Um, same thing if you do something as simple as like a rum and coke. Either add a little more coke or add a little more rum. But when it comes to a Bloody Mary, there's like 15 different things that people might want to add in there. You hope to have them on hand and it, you literally have to customize every single one. And I just feel like it's a little bit harder for me to get behind because I can customize it for whoever and they'll really like it. And I'm sitting here like, that's a terrible cocktail. <laughs> So I decided to do one that I would actually enjoy, but just as any other Bloody Mary, it is very easy to modify according to your own personal taste. So for this Bloody Mary, we did some crazy stuff. I made a green tomato juice. Um, it's going to be more of an Asian theme. This cocktail is called the Green Kijo. Um, so I'm trying to think of like Asian ingredients. That's kind of my focus. And green Kijo means devil woman. Kijo means devil woman or demon woman in Japanese and Bloody Mary has this really interesting history that's kind of similar. Um, so I went with that and then I said green Kijo, so green devil woman um, is basically the name of our cocktail. So for the green tomato juice, if I remember the ratios correctly, it was 300 grams of green tomatoes, not tomatillos. Those are different things, but tomatillos would work one ounce of water, and a quarter teaspoon of miso. I prefer to use white miso, but I had red miso on hand, so I used that. So, give us a little stir. I strained it through a fine strainer, so it's pretty thin, it's not chunky like other Bloody Marys, but we're gonna use four ounces of our green tomato juice. I'm gonna just put those in a shaker. And then we also are going to be using something called, well, not something called, we're using sake, but I decided to try and fat wash it. So for those of you who are unfamiliar with fat washing, it means taking some kind of fat element, such as oil um, or grease that has a flavor, mixing it in with the alcohol, letting it infuse for a while. And in most applications, you would freeze it and then that fat will sol solidify on the top. And then you just scrape that off or pull it off if it actually becomes a really hard puck. 
and then you just double strain your alcohol. And what fat washing does is it infuses a little bit of flavor, but it also gives those alcohols a little bit of a creamier mouthfeel. So sake is a really light rice wine, kind of. So adding that sake element gives it a little bit more richness and it smells really nice and nutty. So for the sesame wash, I do have the recipe. It should be in the pandemic pin up happy hour. Um, and I believe it's also posted on the underground cooking club. But so I already froze it, removed the, I use sesame oil. So this is a sesame washed sake. So I'm gonna use an ounce and three quarters of my sesame sake. I'm gonna pour that right in here as well. And then this cute little jar is a kimchi brine. So I just bought kimchi, like regular grocery store kimchi. And kimchi is a fermented vegetable dish from usually Korea. So the one I bought, I think was radish. I prefer the cabbage. I actually mistakenly grabbed the, the radish one, but it's nice because it was actually a little spicier. But so this is basically spices, hot chili peppers, vinegar, and then whatever the flavor of the vegetable and the kimchi are infused into that liquid. So I just poured off the liquid. And for my recipe, I'm gonna use a quarter ounce of the kimchi brine. And then I'm going to use lemon juice, also a quarter ounce. And then soy sauce, this is not actually kikoman. Um, I buy like a bulk soy sauce and then just pour it into this so I can put it, uh, have it in an easier way to dispense at home. But I'm gonna use a bar spoon. So just a little bit, about a quarter or an eighth of an ounce or 16th of an ounce, depends on how much you wanna put in there. Again, what I would recommend following all of these measurements and then tasting it and adjusting, right? So if you want it saltier, you can add more soy. If you want it spicier, you can add more kimchi broth, or you could just straight up add like a squirt of sriracha. Um, I also have powdered white pepper. I'll put a tiny bit of that in there. And the reason I'm doing white pepper instead of black pepper is black pepper provides more heat, less flavor. White pepper provides more flavor, less heat. So because I'm focusing on flavor, that's why I chose the white pepper. And I'm going to use simple syrup just because I think it rounds out the cocktail, but you don't have to. It's entirely optional. I'm going to use a quarter ounce of simple syrup. So there's a lot going on. This is another reason Bloody Marys can be a total pain in the butt. But so just to recap, if you are following along, you should have four ounces of the green tomato juice, um, one and three quarter ounces of the sesame washed sake, a quarter ounce of the kimchi brine, quarter ounce of lemon juice, quarter ounce of simple syrup if you want, and then a bar spoon of soy sauce and a bar spoon of, or no, sorry, a bar spoon of soy sauce and a pinch of white pepper. So all of that's in here. And before I shake it, what I'm gonna do is prepare my glass. So I chose for this particular cocktail to do a rimmed glass. So I'm going to put a little bit of liquid. In this case, I'm probably just going to use a little bit more of my juice. You can use like a lime wedge or just water. You just need to wet the rim of your glass. I'm going to use a highball for this. And then I made a seasoning mix with some very interesting ingredients that we'll go over here in a second. So there's a, there's a seasoning called furikake which you show and tell in between making cocktails. Fur cake looks like this. Bunch of letters you can't read, but it looks inside like this. So this is your standard furry cake, also known as norikumi furry cake. And really all it is is sesame seeds, a little sugar, a little salt, and then they take the seaweed that we use for um, sushi called nori, which is those really long flat sheets and they just cut it into tiny little pieces. So then it just makes a seasoning blend. Um, and there are different kinds of furikake. There's kinds that are spicy, kinds that have powdered shrimp or powdered mushrooms to give them a little extra umami. So I took some of this and I took some of this, which I know it's kind of hard to see on screen, but this is kind of a dark purple. And this is powdered shisho, also known as beefsteak plant, which sounds gross. <laughs> But red shisho 
or um, sesame leaves sometimes get powdered and crushed like this. And it's just kind of tart. So this is savory and umami, and this is tart. And then I added also a little bit of this, which is chichimito garashi, <laughs> which is just Japanese like spicy peppers. It's kind of like cayenne. You don't have to use any of these. You can put anything at all on the rim of your glass. But I really liked all of these flavors with my cocktail. So I combined them, made a little snack. So now that you have all of that information, I'm going to rim my glass. And it looks really festive when you do a rim with things that have a bunch of different texture. So I'll come over and show it to you guys when I, once I pour it. I don't know, let's see, what's in the spot? I don't know if y'all can see that, but it's kind of irregular. It's not just like a beautifully sugared or salted rim. And I like texture. I think visually it's really appealing. So I've rubbed my glass. Then I am going to put some ice in my shaker and we're going to shake and pour it into our glass. And you have a couple options. You can dirty dump it into the glass or you can strain it over new ice. I'm going to strain it over new ice just so that I don't damage my rim but you can completely dirty dump this. So I'm gonna put ice in my shaker. And I'm gonna proceed to fill my glass with ice very carefully. Them. Lost one. All right, so I'm going to shake this up. Doesn't have to be shaken anything crazy, just a good quick shake to mix all those ingredients. We're going to pour it over our ice. And depending on how much of each ingredient you use, the color of this cocktail will vary. If you use less brine, it would be closer to a true, like a green that the tomato juice has, but because I put a heavy pour, it's more like an amber. And then I made this super awesome sesame candy earlier today, which I can include the recipe for later. But I put a little bit of seaweed in, and that's my extra garnish because I like snacks with my drinks. So this is our green kijo. See now you can see the rim. And that is an Asian butter mint. Cheers. <laughs> Y'all are so quiet today. Love it. So, Noob, do you drink Bloody Marys? I do um, on occasion. And uh, I like, when, if everybody's having them, I'll have them. But yeah. So, you're not like a lover of Bloodies? No, I'm not a lover of them. It's just like the, the rare brunch thing. I'm the same way. I think this is probably the only one I've ever thoroughly enjoyed. And even so, this is a really distinct flavor profile for Bloody Mary. Um, I've, I've served it to a couple people, and their first reaction is that it tastes like ramen. But I think that's just because they associate those flavor profiles with that soup, right? So if you take red tomatoes, add in all of those ingredients, it's like, oh, it tastes like tomato soup. But once you do Asian, ingredients are like, oh, it tastes like ramen. But it's still very it's so much more than the average Bloody Mary. Yeah. I, I like it a lot more. So our next cocktail is going to be something I am super pumped about. Calling it La Calle, which means the street in Spanish. Um, I kind of had a moment last week where I was like, mm, you know what I really want? I want Mexican street corn. And then I asked myself, I wonder I could make that into a cocktail. So I did, and it's delicious. So we're going to go over that cocktail. It's really, really nice. Um, it's kind of like, I guess the best way to describe it, if you're unable to taste it from the get, if you're not mixing along, it's kind of like a corn tequila sour-ish. So what we're going to use is I have these fresh corn kernels that I cut off of a cob. If you are struggling to find fresh produce, I have done this before with canned corn kernels. 
It just tastes a little less uh, fresh, but it's still workable. And then I have a corn husk infused simple syrup. The recipe for this was also on the flyer for the class today. And what I do, if you've ever had an ear of corn, right? Most ears of corn have anywhere between eight to 12 husk leaves on them. So I usually trim the little silk curls that are at the end and then pull off the first four to six leaves. And the reason I do that is those are gonna be the ones that are really tough, the ones that are a darker green, and they've usually absorbed a lot of outside flavors because they're encasing the rest of everything else. So just remove a few of those. And once you start to see the leaves or the husk be more of a pale yellow color or a pale green color, those are the ones you want to use. So to make the husk syrup, you take the husks from one corn, removing the outer ones. And then if you hold them like this, you cut them into four pieces. And then you're going to roast them in your oven for about seven minutes. I want to say on 350 or 375. I have to look at the recipe again. But so they get kind of toasted. So parts of them will be nice and roasty and some of them will still be green. And then I do, that's how many you need for about a quarter cup of sugar to a quarter cup of water. And the reason I don't toast them all the way and the reason I don't not toast them is because the whole point of me using the corn husk syrup is it gets these nice grain and woody notes to them um, as opposed to just fresh corn. So also the smell is absolutely phenomenal. It smells like when you put corn cobs on a grill. But so those roasted notes infuse into the simple syrup. You strain it out after you let it steep, and then you just have what looks like a regular simple syrup. But if I open this and smell it, it smells just like roasted corn. Um, and so when I was trying to make street corn into a cocktail, there were a few elements that are really important. Street corn is usually a sweet corn cob, and then it'll have a bunch of different toppings. It'll have a mayonnaise component, sometimes mixed with sour cream, It'll have the roastiness from being grilled. It'll usually have paprika, cayenne pepper, sometimes chili powder, cilantro, and grated cheese. So if you like cilantro, because not everybody does, some people have that genetic factor that makes it taste like fish soap. If you do like cilantro, then my recommendation would be to make the corn husk syrup. And once you turn it off and the sugar is dissolved, throw about a handful of cilantro leaves in there just to let it infuse a little. Um, it works really well and it's like lightly herbaceous without being really, really cilantro forward. So that would be the way to add cilantro to this cocktail. This particular variety I'm doing today has no cilantro in it. Um, it's just the actual syrup. And then um, I make a spicy spice blend, I guess it's very redundant, but I make a spicy spice blend for the rim of my cocktail. And for that one, I use salt. I use about a teaspoon of salt and then a pinch to a quarter teaspoon of cayenne pepper, um, a pinch to a quarter teaspoon of chili powder, and a pinch to a quarter teaspoon of smoked paprika. And that's kind of a, a wide range. So adjust it to the flavors that you like. I use smoked paprika rather than regular because it helps get that vibe of the fact that it's street corn because you're getting some smokiness from there you're getting some roasted from the syrup so that brings it back to the street corn element um if you like it spicier go heavier on the cayenne pepper um and just use regular salt you don't have to get all crazy and use fancy salts but so you're gonna have your spice mix ready and then for the cocktail itself what we're going to be using is we're going to use first about a quarter cup of corn kernels and i know that sounds like a lot but trust me, if you do it with the less, you don't get as much corn flavor. So I'm going to just spoon about a quarter cup of these into my shaker. And the important part here is to muddle them properly. So you're going to sit here and muddle them, pushing and kind of rotating your hand if you've never used a muddler before. That's what you're usually doing is creating pressure. Um, you can use a rolling pin, if you have a tapered French rolling pin and you don't have a muddler, you can use a, the base of a wooden spoon if you have one that's nice and broad. But so you're just going to sit here and just kind of muddle, 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 and you'll see that they start to release like a milkiness, like a, like corn juice, if you will. And I know that sounds kind of unappealing to some people, but it's, it's good, trust me. So we're sitting here and we're muddling away our corn. For this cocktail, I am definitely using a reposado tequila because the reposado notes 
on that tequila from the barrel that it's aged in are again going to amplify all of the like street corn flavors that we're going for that we can't really do with a cocktail. Um, you can't like grill a cocktail. You can smoke it, but you can't grill it. So in the interest of keeping it simple, we're using ingredients that will give us that instead of techniques. So I've got my corn nice and muddled. So you can time muddled for about 30 seconds to a minute. Just kind of depends on the width of the shaker tin. And then I'm going to add in two ounces of my Reposado tequila. You could use an Añejo or a Silver, um, but definitely the darker the tequila or the more aged it is, the better it'll be for this cocktail. So two ounces of that. And then I have lime juice. I'm going to use one whole ounce of lime juice. Put that in the shaker. And we're going to use a three quarter ounce of our husk infused simple syrup. Okay, so all of that's in my shaker now. And if you are making these at home, this is something I like to prepare the glass ahead of time, kind of like the rimming for the Bloody Mary. So street corn is kind of messy. I figured I can't make a cocktail that's too refined because then it gets too far from the streets. So I just kind of put like a brush of simple syrup on my cocktail glass and then sprinkled my seasoning mix on it so that when I drink it, I have to lick my glass <laughs> and then drink it because we got to keep it a little messy for authenticity. So I have my glass ready. If you want to rim it, you can totally rim it. If you want like more spice, definitely rim it. But now I have my shaker. Again, it'll have the quarter cup of muddled corn kernels, the two ounces of Reposado tequila, one ounce of lime juice, and three quarter ounce of the husk infused simple syrup. I'm gonna add ice. We're gonna shake for about 15 seconds. And then I'm gonna strain it up, which means without ice, directly into the cocktail glass that I've already prepared. While I'm shaking, I'll uh, check Facebook and see if there are any comments or questions that I need to answer. <laughs> if, I, if I can do two things differently with both of them. <laughs> That's really nice and shaken. Because we do have chunky and ingredients in our cocktail sh shaker, I'm definitely going to double strain this, which means I'm using a Hawthorne strainer and a fine mesh strainer. So I'm going to use the Hawthorne on the cocktail shaker and then strain it a second time through this fine mesh. And if you really wanted to, you could roast half of the corn kernels that you are intending to muddle into this cocktail. But it will change the color. And I really like this cocktail on how pretty the really creamy yellow is. So I prefer not to roast it and then try to add in roasty flavors with my tequila and my smoked paprika rather than changing the color of the cocktail. Now, if you were listening to the whole spiel, Mexican corn has that element of like creaminess, right? Because mayonnaise or sour cream, which we accomplished by muddling the, the milkiness out of the corn cob or the corn kernels. But there's no cheese in the cocktail. I tried rimming this cocktail with cheese. Great idea. Finally, great, like some Parmesan, put it on there. Me personally, there was not enough cheese. So I made another snack for my cocktail. Just cut a giant cube of cheese that I'm not even gonna put in the glass. You just two-handed. I'm gonna bring this over so you can see this, guys. It's so beautiful. Just look at how pretty this is. And it's delicious. So good. I see your face move. I don't even want some of this. I'm just disappointed that the cheese is not in the shape of Texas. I know, I know. The infamous Texas shaped cheese got used in last week's cooking class. <laughs> And I didn't feel like I could actually eat another eight ounces of cheese before bartending. 
So we got a little bit of you. I will, I will definitely, I'm definitely not on my A game. It's like B game, but there's still cheese. So it's good. So I would lick this, then drink, or if you have a rim, I recommend rimming half of it. So you can kind of get back and forth between the spice and then they're killing it and bringing it back. But it's just a beautiful, it's almost the same color as the cheese. Pretty much. That's a beautiful creamy yellow, a little bit of spice and a snack. So good. So excited about this. Oh, so tasty. So before we continue, I just want to see, does anybody have any questions so far about any of those procedures? Yes, no, no, okay. So as you can tell, like I said, a lot of these recipes this week, there's all this crazy stuff going on. But all of these things are easy to prepare ahead of time and then keep in your fridge. Like the simple syrup will last for weeks. So you can go ahead and prepare that in a big batch if you want to. The corn cocktail, believe it or not, batches beautifully. The muddling of the corn uh, kernels is what takes the longest, but you could make a pitcher of this and then just have it in your fridge and just pour it on a glass. And if you got lazy with it, you could just make like a, take a salt shaker, put your little spicy mix in there and then just kind of like drink and shake some on there. You know, I'm all about it being messy and kind of very hands-on because it's supposed to be street corn, guys. It's great. But yeah, so that's the La Calle. And then we have one more cocktail today before we finish our class. And this is a really, really nice cocktail. This is definitely, um, I believe it's the most savory of the three. So the Bloody Mary is very, has a lot of vegetable notes. Like it's very bright and crisp, but very vegetable. And then the street corn one is really nice, but there's so many flavor profiles going on. You have the smoke, you have the sweet corn, you have the tart, you have the notes from the aged tequila. And then the one we're doing now um, is something I call a garden sip. And I call it that because all of the flavors are very much garden vegetables that you could grow quite easily um, and fruits that you could grow quite easily. And I mixed that um, it's a low ABV cocktail, which means it's got a lower alcohol um, content because my main alcohol for that cocktail is an amber vermouth. And instead of doing what most people do, where you use a stronger base spirit, such as gin, vodka, whiskey, tequila, um, I took that and swapped it out for what would usually be a modifier. Vermouths being lower in alcohol, softer in flavor, tend to be modifiers. So I kind of just swapped it around to where vermouth is gonna be our base spirit. And then our modifier is going to be gin. I'm super, super excited about this gin. <laughs> so this is Sip Smith gin. Um, and I'm wearing this lovely neckerchief that's like the same logo and green as this bottle. Not because I'm sponsored, but because I have this really cool friend named Kelly Rivers and she swagged me up. Plus it's my favorite color green. Plus this gin is amazing. And I feel like I've come full circle. I was a baby chef over 10 years ago, um, when I was about 21, my very first restaurant that I worked at abroad was in Spain or Barcelona in Barcelona. I was working at this restaurant and I was having trouble integrating with the staff because they spoke Catalan, which I did not. And I was just the only girl there. I was also very young. And the chef gave me his keys and let me go into his vault and pick a bottle of anything I wanted and we could drink it all night. And I didn't know anything in that vault. <laughs> I couldn't, I didn't know anything about anything. I was barely a cook. Um, and then I saw this label. I thought it was absolutely gorgeous. And I picked up this bottle. And I didn't know at the time that it was gin. I didn't really pay attention to it. I was just like, ooh, pretty bottle. Let's drink that. <laughs> and then I never saw the bottle again until a few years ago at the cocktail conference in San Antonio. And now I have a bottle of my own. So it's just, I feel very full circle. I'm like, the Sip Smith has followed me from the kitchen to the bar. It took 10 years, but we made it. So for this cocktail, this is also going to be a shaken cocktail. Um, we are going to use an ounce and a half, no, sorry, an ounce and a quarter of amber vermouth. If you don't have amber vermouth, you can definitely use a white vermouth. If you have a sweet white vermouth, I would recommend that. Um, but it works really well with the dry white vermouth as well. So I'm going to do an ounce and a quarter of my vermouth. And then I'm going to use a half. 
half ounce of the Sipsmith London Dry Gin. And now we're gonna like build our garden essentially. So I have rhubarb juice. And if you can find fresh rhubarb and put it through a juicer, definitely the best way to do that. Um, I didn't find fresh rhubarb, I found frozen, and I don't have a juicer. So I just put chunks of the frozen rhubarb. Um, I made sure to get one that is just naturally frozen, no added sugars. Put it in a blender with some water, strain it out, and now I have a rhubarb juice. Definitely not the best rhubarb juice, but it's pretty darn good. And it's very, very, very tart. If you've never seen rhubarb, it's similar to celery. The stalks are like green and pink. They're absolutely stunning. But because I couldn't find any fresh, that's not a good garnish today. But we're going to use a half ounce of the rhubarb juice. Then we're going to use a half ounce of lemon. No, sorry, a quarter ounce. I'm all over the place. A quarter ounce. And then I made a very, very, very pretty simple syrup. As you can see, it's a beautiful color of orange. And this is an orange and fennel simple syrup. So fennel is a really cool plant that looks kind of like a celery bulb on the bottom, and then it's got these really big fronds that look similar to like dill leaves, but the flavor profile of it is very bright and crisp like a celery plant, but it's got hints of anise. Um, so it's kind of got a licorice -y type flavor, if you're familiar with that. And I'm usually not into those flavor profiles, but it works really well with this. So we're gonna use a half ounce of that. The recipe for this syrup is also on the flyer from the class that got published. So, I messed up some of those ratios as I was saying them. So I'm gonna go back over them so we have them clear. So it is an ounce and a quarter of the amber vermouth, a half ounce of the Sip Smith gin, a half ounce of the rhubarb juice, a quarter ounce of lemon juice, and then a half ounce of the orange and fennel simple syrup. So all of those ingredients are in our shaker. I'm going to shake this up and then I'm going to pour it over a really nice big ice cube in a rocks glass, like a whiskey glass. So that looks like this. Okay. So. This cocktail to me just tastes like morning outside. So it's one of those things where if the weather's nice and not crazy hot, um, and you just had this as a brunch type of cocktail, it'd be absolutely beautiful. So this giant ice cube for my new ice cube tray. I'm gonna put it in my rocks glass. And then I'm just gonna regular strain this cocktail right over my beautiful gigantic ice cube. I made a little pinwheel with an orange because it's a garden. So we're going to pretend there's like a little breeze because Chandler's a total nerd. So we're going to put our nice little orange pinwheel in the glass. And this is the garden set. So cheers. Oh, it's so good. New. Enjoy your social distancing birthday celebration. We'll see you later. Bye, guys. We'll see you later. Bye. Good. Have a good day, hon. So this is the garden sip. Like I said, great brunch cocktail, great all-day cocktail. The lower alcohol percentage would allow you to drink it all day long. Um, if you really wanted to, you could always amp up some of the ratios of like the gin or the vermouth. But it's really, really nice, guys. It's bright, it's tart, it's herbaceous, it's not very sweet, it's just sweet enough, the way you put just enough salt on like a steak to make it taste good, there's just enough sugar element in here to just bring everything to the forefront, and it is just beautiful, and the gin just helps bring out all of those flavors, because gin is based on botanicals, so all of the spices and herbs that go into gin play really nicely with all of the other flavors in the glass. Yeah, that is our little cocktail demo for today. Any questions, Miss Beth? 
All right, well, for those of you who are tuning in live on Facebook, today's class was actually kind of quick and fast. Um, if you do have any questions, please feel free to reach out, whether that's privately through a message um, on Instagram or Facebook. Um, you can also leave any kind of commentary on the video so I can get back to you about it. Um, but today we will be cooking at six o'clock and I will be making Texas caviar, which is a black eyed pea dish that is very easily modified for multiple diets. It's very tasty and it works as an appetizer or a main or like a party dish. And then I'll be making a really awesome dessert from Vienna called Marilyn Kirill. And um, it's got a really cool little story that goes along with it. And if you did make the corn cocktail, hold on to all of your corn stuff, the cobs, the kernels, the silk, the husks, because we're going to get kind of corny and nerdy. <laughs> it's a bad joke. I'm getting ready for like <laughs> Father's Day. I'm practicing all my bad jokes. Uh, we're going to get corny in the cooking class. It's going to be great. So um, tune in later at six or, you know, just be a creeper and watch on live like some of my other friends do. That's fine too. <laughs> But yeah, I hope you guys come back. I take suggestions all the time for themes or things you want to see me work with. Or if you have something that you want me to design specifically for you, maybe you like a couple different flavors, don't know how to put them all together in a glass, I'm here for it. So I'm going to go ahead and end the Facebook live stream and hopefully see most of y'all in a few hours. Let's see.